Good morning, New Life Manitou. Hello. I'm glad to see all of you. My name's Brett. I'm a volunteer here. Let's stand as we read the scriptures this morning. Today's reading is from Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 41. Every year, Jesus' parents went to the Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to, their, to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking that he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know that I would be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you remain standing as we pray? Lord, we believe these words in the text of Scripture are not just an ancient textbook, but these words are living and active and breathing. They are alive today as we look at the encounter you had, Jesus, with your earthly parents. Lord, show us, teach us, bend us according to your ways and your word. Lord, we pray this in your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God's people shouted, Amen. 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 You may now be seated. Thank you for standing. I'm going to give you a little quiz. We have started a new sermon series. The sermon series is called Encounters with Jesus. Two weeks ago, David Martin, who is Sarah's husband, was here preaching, and he preached about Jesus' encounter with John the Baptist. Baptist. Five points for Brett. And then we went out and did baptisms. Remember that? If you were here last week, which it's funny how our memory works. We remember certain things, but then it's hard to remember, like, what did I just eat for breakfast? I can't remember that. So I think it's the same way when it comes to sermons, uh, even as a preacher, I'm telling you this. But last week I was here and we preached about Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well or the Samaritan woman at the well. Yes. And today we are obviously going to look at this story, this interaction between Jesus and and his parents. And on the one hand, it's a parent rea- interaction with their son. On the other hand, if we believe Jesus is fully God, then at the same time, this is an interaction between God himself and his creation, which happened to be his earthly parents. Interesting, mysterious, and something we are going to dive in and look at today and say, Lord, what can you teach us from this encounter you had with your earthly parents, Mary and Joseph? So the first point this morning, if you're writing things down, I always appreciate, at least in my own head, uh, to write things down and take notes. Even if I never look at the notes again, there's something about the process of writing them down that helps me. Point number one, point one of three, is that Jesus is the Son of God, the Father. It's a declaration of what we're looking at, what we believe. Jesus is the Son of God, the Father. So it says this. So looking at this story, you just heard it, but let me uh, point out a couple things. It says, when the festival was over, that was the Passover festival, they took a journey. They went to Jerusalem. While his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. They were unaware of it. Parents, have you ever lost your kid? I'll tell a story in a minute. They were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began to look for him among the relatives. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem. Verse 46 says, and then after three days, 
we'll stop there and just consider uh, jokingly, I, I could say that Mary and Joseph had one job, right? To keep the Son of God alive. Guys had one job. And they lose him, and then they're restored to him, and we get to see this encounter, which is a story for us all to learn something, but I say that kind of jokingly. If you've been a parent for any amount of time uh, and your kids are walking, there's probably a story you have of losing your kid for at least a little while, right? Am I crazy? Don't look at me like I'm a bad parent. Parents, anybody lose their kid, be honest? Okay, okay, yes, thank you. Um, So we were in Soda Springs Park a couple summers ago with Jay, and Erica and I were, were just talking. Talking, uh, we're doing what pastors do and, and, and shepherds do. We're talking to people, interacting with them. Well, I was talking, Erica was talking to somebody that would come to our church. Uh, I was talking to someone. We were just talking, you know, and the kids were at the park playing and Jay took it upon himself. He was, I think, maybe five at the time. And he wandered off in Soda Springs Park. And then it was this interaction between Erica and I. I was like, I thought you had him. No, I thought you had him. I thought you had him. No, I thought you had him. And he's gone. And Soda Springs Park is not the nicest place in Manitou Springs. There's some characters there. And so we instantly, you just think like, what? He's, he's been taken. He's stolen. He's in a van. That's his parents. That's just what you think. Uh, and then we're looking around, calling his name. That panic, that was probably a two-minute, three-minute period of time, but in my head it was like four hours of time where I'm frantically searching for Jay. And then another thought came to my mind. It's summertime. The the Fountain Creek runs right there and it's flowing really good. I thought, He's probably floated down the creek. He's, he, he, we just expect the worst. And, and we go down there, and sure enough, he's in there. He's just fine, and he's playing in the creek. And at the same time, you have, at least as I did as a parent, I think we see this in the story, you have all these feelings of like, thank God, he's okay. And then on the same hand, you have these feelings of anger. <laughs> Why did you run off? Why did you, t- at the same time, Thank God you're alive, you're here, you're not in a van going down the road in some kidnapper's vehicle. And at the same time, you're mad. And I think what we see here is something like that. Because his parents see him after three days. Think about that. Like no text messages. Uh, We assume, at least I assume, I've always been taught that um, in this story, it was probably a large caravan of of people that went down from Nazareth, a Galilee area, to Jerusalem. And so I assume that Mary and Joseph assumed, oh, he's probably with one of his other cousins or somebody in the family, and he he gets separated for a day. They didn't notice he was gone for a whole day, and then they notice, and they don't see him for three days. Imagine it. No text messages, no Amber Alerts, the fear and the, the who knows what Mary and Joseph were, were thinking, they get to him and they're astonished. That's a good word. They're astonished. He's there. And they'll find out he's, he's been asking questions and teaching like the philosophers, the, the, the um, pastors, the religious leaders of the day. He's been asking them questions and he's been teaching them. So they're astonished. And then it gets into what, of course, all parents ask. Why would you have treated us like this? Your father and I have been... It's a, we would say worried sick, right? That's just what parents say. We've been worried sick. Mary says, your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. The Greek there of anxiously, they're being pained, searching for Jesus. And then we get into this interaction of a son and his parents. And at the same time, on the other hand, it's an interaction between the creator of all and his creation, which happens to be his earthly mother and father. And Jesus says, and we don't know the tone here. I think Brett read it well. It's just kind of a factual. Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? We could, we could think, I would say wrongly, that this was like a bratty, know-it-all attitude. Like, wow, you know where I was. You, you know I had to be in my father's house. But I think it's more here we're getting a glimpse into the creator Jesus, Lord of all, speaking to his creation, comforting them, saying, this is where I had to be. I had to be in my father's house. And it seems like in this conversation, Jesus is correcting his own mother in a, in a holy, gracious way because she says, your mother and father and I have been worried. We've been uh, uh, anxiously searching for you. And Jesus turns it and says, well, didn't you know that I had to be in my 
father's house. He's reminding them of the story that we all know, we all talk about around Christmas time. And if you look outside, oh, it stopped snowing, look at that. But it's like Christmas time. We're heading this way towards Christmas time where we talk about the coming of Jesus, God, fully God, fully man on this earth. And Jesus knows that story because he's God. He knows everything. And he's, he's like, what, 12 years old? That's sixth grade. That's the time when uh, you take classes and you learn about your body and stuff. You know what I'm talking about? And, and so Jesus is reminding his parents, like, I know where I actually came from. I know the story that the line in, in the scripture says that what is incarnated inside your womb is of God. The Holy Spirit is inside of you. He has done this, and it is God. You're a virgin, yet you're with child. How can this be? Well, it's of God. You, Jesus, God on earth, and Jesus, the creator of all, is reminding his earthly mother and father of this fact. Like, I am, you know the story. You were there when all of this went down, and then here I am, 12 years old and nine months later after this wonderful thing that has happened that Mary gave birth to God. Think about that for just a second. There's this song, hopefully we sing it again uh, at some point going into Christmas or on, we're gonna have a Christmas service on the 23rd of this, uh, of December. And there's this acapella song, I'm sure you've heard of it, that that says, uh, Mary, did you know? Do you know the song? It's probably my new favorite Christmas song. It came out a while ago, but last year, New Life North sang it a cappella, and it's just a wonderful song. And some of the lines, here's one of the lines. Mary, did you know that the baby boy, that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? It's asking this question. Mary, could you have known, would you have known that the person you're giving birth to is God himself? Think about that for just a second. Like there's There's a lot of people who are very close to God. We look in the Bible and we see prophets and Moses and Ezekiel and Elijah and John the Baptist in the New Testament. There's a lot of people that were very close with God. But can you think of another person that was this close to God while earthly alive, that they had God inside of them, gave birth to God, then nursed God? God. Think about this. Is is it blow your mind like it blows my mind that, that Mary is this person who, like, there's none like her in the text of Scripture that she was that close to God. And I think about um, my growing up. I grew up Catholic and becoming Protestants. Many of you have Catholic backgrounds. And so many Protestants looking to Catholics kind of say, you know, there's a list of things we, we, we just don't see eye to eye. And one of them at the very top of the list is probably like they just asked, we would ask Protestants of Catholic, what's the deal with Mary? Like, why is she so important? And we as Protestants have probably moved from Mary of any kind. And like the only proper way to talk about Mary is around Christmas time, but it's snowing. So we can talk about Mary without look, looking funny at ourselves. But Mary, and just as a side note, like I, I think like I've been to especially South American countries, Guatemala, Mexico, Belize, and I've seen churches that they just watch what they're doing. And, and we as Protestants would just say, they're worshiping Mary. And you'd, you'd talk to them and they would say, yeah, we're worshiping Mary. And we would just say, hello, like she is a creation. She gave birth to God and she should be honored above you know, all the, the created beings. She gave birth to God. No one's like that. She got to nurse God. She got to look God in the eyes as a baby. Like, yes, she's to be the most honored, but worshiped? No, 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 no. She's the creation of God. And here she is interacting with God himself as a 12-year-old boy, fully human and fully God. And, And it's this wonderful story where we could look into it and say, here's Jesus reminding Mary and Joseph that his true father is the father of the house, the temple, God himself. And we look at scripture and we see, just as a reminder, that this first point was Jesus is uh, the son of God the father. Jesus is God himself. Uh, We would say that clearly as Christians. I have friends who I respect who are of, I would just say I respect them as of, as of different religion, like I would respect Buddhists or Muslims. I just have respect for people, and, and we agree to disagree, and it's, I would just say it's a different religion. But I have friends who are Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, uh, 12 tribes. There, there's, a, there's a smattering of 
I would just say different religions that fall into this somehow category of saying they believe in the Bible and yet they don't believe that Jesus is God. And I would just say, why? How could that be? Have you not read John 1, 1, where it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Some of those other religions even change that wording there because it's just so clear. John 10, 30 says, I and the Father am one. Jesus is talking about him and the Father being one. Like, wow, that is a declaration. Thomas bows down and worships Jesus and says, my Lord and my God, and Jesus does not stop him. John 8, 58, Jesus says, before Abraham was I am. He's, he's calling on the name of God, saying that, yes, he's greater than Abraham. He is the I am, Yahweh. Colossians, this is the last series we did before this series, is smattered with, with declarations like this. 2.9 says, in him, in Jesus, the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. We can't miss this as Christians. We cannot miss this as as created beings of God, that Jesus came to this world fully God, fully human, and he has these interactions with people. He saves the world, and we can know about him. We can know him now. Point number two is this. So it kind of changes direction of a sermon just a little bit to talk about the Father's house. But point two of this, two of three, is God the Father wants us in his house. And here we are today on a snowy day. You're in the house. Pat yourself on the back, would you? (laughs) God the Father wants us in his house. Jesus says to his parents, Mary says, you know, your father and I have been looking for you. And then Jesus says, I had to be in my father's house. This place is important. The father's house is important. And and for the next five minutes, uh, this conversation is going to get a little real. Um, We're going to talk about church. I'm going to remind you. Uh, of, of what church is, the importance of, of gathering. I mean, you're looking around, it's like, yeah, this is, this is Sunday. This is what we do. Even if it's snowing, we try to make our way here. And some of us got stuck, uh, just talking to a girl, got stuck, but she got here. And so this is what we do. We come to church, no big deal. Actually, it's a huge deal. Actually, the Father's house, worshiping the Lord is a huge deal. And so I have a couple points of what the church is not, what people wrongly think the church is. I have a couple points here. And, and these are, to, I think we've all been guilty of some of these things. I think in our own thinking, I think uh, we, we definitely interact and talk to people who, who just straight up think these things. And what I want us to be is like a rudder of a ship. A huge ship is turned by a tiny little rudder. And we, the congregation in Manitou Springs, New Life Church, we can be like a little rudder on a huge ship of our society that says, actually, Church is not these things. Actually, church is very important. So this is what sometimes people think church is, uh, wrongly think church is, simply a a lecture for good info. Uh, People say, oh, come to church. You know, you could get lessons about daily life or good philosophy or how to raise your kids or a good budget or self-help kind of stuff. Like come to church and just get some good advice, some tips for living. And that would be horribly wrong if that's all you thought church was. Church is the resurrection power of of the word of God inside of our lives that can change us and mold us according to God's will. And when we gather and worship, we are worshiping the living God, and it is not just a self-help thing. Amen? Amen. 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 Okay, good. That's that's a wrong thing thought number one. Wrong th- wrong thing thought number two is that church is not just a concert for inspiration, and it's certainly a place where sometimes people oh I just feel so good in church. I know around Christmas and Easter we invite people in and, and there's there's new people that come and sometimes there's just tears and it's like why I just feel so good there's people here that love me and care for me and, and you're talking about wonderful things and it's just so in, inspirational and, and sometimes people treat church like a gym like oh I'm just gonna come it's all about me I'm gonna work out my spiritual muscles and then I'm gonna go and I'm gonna feel good about myself and it's me 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 and we're all guilty of this and it's the consumeristic mentality that, oh, we come to church, what do we get out of it? What do we, uh, you know, people talk about 
getting fed uh, in, in church. And I think we all come to a place. I know I years ago came to a place in my life where I, st- I was going to the same church. And then all of a sudden, I just realized I'm not getting fed here anymore. And it wasn't the church that changed. It was me. Like, I was growing as a leader. And, and that was my, just like, I need to be a part of the church in such a way that to helps it grow. Because it's not about me. It's about God, it's about the Lord, and that's ultimately what it's about. So it's not just a concert for inspiration for me, 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 me. It's about God. Amen? Amen. 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 Okay, the next one is a, a gathering of people just like us. Church is obviously not a country club, a social club, a club where we can all get together and we all think alike when it comes to uh, non-foundational opinions. I, I often talk to people who don't go to church but are Christians, and they'll say, oh, church for me is a bunch of buddies who get together and, and we, we hang out, we, we go to a coffee shop and we have deep conversations. That's church for me. And, and I will lovingly, graciously say, yeah, that's great that you have that. Let, let's call that fellowship. Let's not call that church. Like, that, that's great that you have that, but that's not this. That's not where we gather and we worship the living God together. That's not where the word of God is preached. That's some good buddies having great fellowship. That's what that is. Church is not just a gathering of people like us that we just stick together like little buddies. Uh, The last point here is this. A church is not, as people wrongly think, a a place to go when there's nothing else on a Sunday morning to do. (laughs) This is a good one. This is, uh, this one's hard for me to, because I I hear it, because we live in Colorado, right? There's always something. It's like, it's so nice in the summer. It's like, why would we go to church? We could be doing, and then it's like Sundays like this. Like, why would we go to church? It's cold out. Like, so it's, you hear both. Like, why would we go to church? It's so nice. Why would we go to church? It's so cold. That we don't live in a place of thinking about like Minnesota. We're going to go to Minnesota for Thanksgiving, the Kirk and Dahl tribe, our little family. And there's nothing else to do in Minnesota. It's like freezing as negative 50. It's like, what what else are we going to do? We're going to go to church. And in the summertime, what are we going to do? Sit around and slap mosquitoes? No, there's nothing else to do. We'll go to church. (laughs) We live in Colorado. There's always something else to do. And church is not just an extracurricular thing when there's nothing else to do. Lord, help us that that we live in a day and a time, 2018, where uh, Memorial Day is tomorrow um, and and people have given their (laughs) Veterans Day. You know what I meant. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Veterans Day, where people have given their lives. Right? We, we celebrate those who have gone before us, those serving now in the military, given us freedoms to go to church, to, to worship the God we believe is and was and always will be. And yet, I, I think the current stat today is that the average person that says, I'm really invested in my church, the average person that says, oh yeah, I go to church all the time, I'm always, the average person that says those things usually goes to church 1.5 times a month. And that's the person that's like, I'm, I'm all in. And, and that's the, the church is seemingly an extracurricular activity in our lives. And, and I'm, I'm pointing at myself as well. Like I realize that we all can't make it every day, uh, every, every Sunday. But the importance, it's, it's a matter of priorities. And, and I, I realize this is maybe, everybody's kind of looking down right now, like, yeah, you're right, I missed last week, I missed the week before. It's, listen, I know, I know, I know, but, but the power of gathering and worshiping the Lord, this is the most wonderful thing on the earth, the church, and if you don't understand that, then keep coming, and you will get it and see how wonderful this thing is that, is, that we call church. One last point on that is, is I think a lot of people, I hear this a lot, that the people just need rest. Like, oh, you didn't see it at church. Oh, yeah, we just needed to sleep in for an extra hour. And this is, this is about to get real. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, okay, thank you, two of you. Um, <laughs> Lord, help me. Uh, I think there's, uh, like, if, if you're sick and you have 103 temperature, yeah, stay. You can't come to church. If you stayed all night, your kid has diphtheria. Stay home, for goodness sakes. But rest, like, 
this is the place of true rest. This is like what we're experiencing now, the worship, the, the speaking of the word, the reading of scripture. This is a deep rest that will give you rest more than sleeping in for a half hour. It reminds me of last week's sermon where Jesus says, I have, there is water that you can drink, literal water. You keep drinking out of this well. You're gonna keep getting thirsty, but there is living water from the inside out that you will drink it of God and you will forever be full. You will never need another drink of water. And I think that kind of rest, like we could sleep in and that will give us you know, half hour, an extra hour of sleep and that is rest, but there is a deep sabbatical kind of rest that comes in the life of the church that is true, true rest. Can I get an Amen. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Thank goodness you could look up now. Um, every year, you look at the text of Scripture, and every Sunday, Christians were gathered. Paul gathers every Sunday, uh, and there's special occasions where people go above and beyond to just gather. And, and here's one of those. It says that every year, the, the parents of Jesus would, would bring their family, they would come and they would worship in Jerusalem. And think about what they had to give up to do that. They were miles, probably 100 or so miles between Galilee and Jerusalem. You could look at the map and correct me later. But that's a long way to walk. This is before you know hopping in the minivan with a suitcase and finding a hotel down the road. Uh, this is walking 100 miles with everything you would need for the journey, for all the people, for your time there, and then the journey back. And you would have to assume that you're probably not going to find a place to stay in Jerusalem. It's going to be too crowded. You're going to be tenting it. Imagine the sacrifice that Jesus' family Mary and Joseph had to do um, to be there and, and just leaving their, their jobs and their houses for a set of time, probably weeks, in order to go. They just did it every year. And I think there's people, there's saints that come to church every Sunday and celebrate. And there is something to be said about, like, yeah, we've given up these other things because we know that the church is the body of Christ. You know, I've, I've said things that the church is not, but here's what the church is. Usually, it's hard to pin down a definition, so we often use metaphor. The church is the body of Christ, the communion of saints, a one holy, universal, apostolic gathering of believers who will conquer in Christ's glory the thing that the gates of hell will not prevail against. It is the thing that, that we as a church body, we can sing, it is well with our soul at the same time. How long until it's all made right, Lord? The church is the greatest thing on the earth. Amen? Amen. 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 Finally, point number three is this. Treasure truth in your heart. This is what Mary does. Mary comes, sees her little boy, 12 years old, who is God himself, interacting with the philosophers, the, the leaders, the, the uh, of their day, and, and this interaction happens. Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had you be in my father's house? But they did not understand what they were saying to them. Then he went down. So this story you know, kind of has a conclusion. He went down to Jerusalem with them. He was obedient to them. But his mother, what's it say, treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. And so what do we do with truth? What does Mary do here that, that we can, can do as well as a model? She treasures it in her heart. She accepts it, believes it, hopes upon it. That is what we can do. That is what we should do with truth. And I, I began the first point of the sermon is that Jesus is fully God and fully man. He's the son of God the Father. He's God what are we to do with that? There's, there's some people in here, I, I imagine in a, in, a, in a group this size, there's some people are just like, I'm coming to check church out. Like, who is Jesus? And what do you do with that information? Well, I would implore you, I would, I would say, treasure that. It is something that we have accepted. If you're a member here, it's something we believe in, we hope in. But I want to invite you to, to treasure that truth that Jesus is fully God in your heart. We, we always, at the end of every service, we have an altar ministry, and every Sunday is really an altar call to come down and say, uh, ask for prayer, to tell someone, like, I'm really treasuring these things in my heart right now, that, that Jesus is Lord. I want to talk to someone. I want to ask someone more about that, and that would be very appropriate this morning to, to hear these words 
of the child Jesus talking to his creation, which happens to be his mom and dad. And it's this declaration that he is God and he has to be in his father's house and he gets to teach those elders, those teachers, those philosophers of the day. It says this, so after three days, they found him, Mary and Joseph found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. And I imagine it was the kind of questions that Jesus asked, where Jesus already knows the answer to those questions because he's, because he's God. He knows the answers, and yet he's asking questions. And then it goes on to say this, so it's very clear. Everyone who heard him, so everyone, even like the, you know, the, the, the people that were in charge, the people that were supposed to know stuff, everyone was amazed at his understanding and his answer. So he wasn't just asking questions and learning himself. He was providing answers. And when his parents saw this, they were astonished. Have you ever ran into someone that just knows the Bible really well? I think about my own Christian journey I don't think I, I knew the Bible very well. I grew up in church, and as I said, I was a Catholic and knew a bunch of stories, but they were kind of just jarred in my mind, and I, I couldn't put them all together. I really didn't know the Bible that well and, and had a coming of faith in my own life in high school where I had to think, is this really my own faith? Is this just something I did growing up? My parents drug me to church. I, was, I, I enjoyed it, but I just I, I had to make faith my own. And I was really at the like 10th grade thinking, should I give up on faith or should I lean in? What do I personally, Joe Kirkendall, what do I really believe? And I had a really good friend that knew the Bible really well. His name is Bo Bannister. And he's now a pastor at a church in another state. And he just had answers. I would ask him things. It's like, so what's the deal with Satan? What's the deal with the red letter? Why is there red letters in the Bible? What's the deal with this prophet Ezekiel? What's the deal with the revelation at the end? You know, why is the Bible so long? And he had answers. Like, he just knew the Bible. Like, I think many of us would know the Bible. And I was just astonished. I was amazed that he knew the Bible. He had answers answers. And I remember writing down questions on a little piece of paper, and then I lost a piece of paper, so I'd write down questions on my hand, and then I would show up to eat lunch with this guy, and I would just drill him. Like, what's this? What's that? Like, what does this mean? Like, who's, the, who's this in the Bible? And he had answers, and I was just astonished. And I imagine some kind of comparison between these people who were at the temple courts listening to God himself. We believe Jesus, even as a 12-year-old here, was fully God, declaring and saying truths. And all of these things marry treasures in her heart. Think about that. The good news of Jesus, God himself, incarnate God coming to earth, saving the world, proclaiming that he is God and Mary treasuring these things in her heart. I want to invite you to stand with me. If you're in the worship band, you can come forward. If you're serving communion, you can come forward. But I want to consider... Um, the treasures that, that truth is, the treasure that Jesus is to us. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Lord, we stand here and we pray to you, this, the same God who came to this earth thousands of years ago and, and was a 12-year-old boy because you, God, were fully human and fully God, talking with your parents, talking to your own creation, talking about your father's house and teaching the people around you. Lord, you had so much compassion. You had so much love. You didn't just show a way or point a way. Lord, you yourself are the way, the truth, and the life. Your truth, Lord, sets people free. Your truth, your word is a lamp. Lord, we declare this morning in our agreement, your house is an important house. Your things your ways are the most important things and ways on this earth. And Lord, we treasure them. We stand in awe of you, Lord. We wait upon you. Lord, we say to you, speak. Your servant, your servants are listening.